familiar theme song. You know what that means? We got to go out to uh, California, to Hollywood, USA, where they make all them motion pictures. And Michael Snyder, he's going to tell you which to see and which ones to avoid. Hello, Michael. Hi, Alex, and uh, greetings, Gabnet listeners and uh, people on Roku and wherever. You mean taking a little time off? I've been doing some traveling, but the blockbusters for summer have started to roll out. And I thought we'd do a kind of compilation of what's out there. Uh, just to get people caught up. And uh, we're going to lead with something that's opening this weekend, this being the 4th of July weekend. And it's a a character that's dear to me and someone who you and I have watched uh, as a character for a number of years. And in fact, uh, Indiana Jones uh, was the central figure in a couple movies that you and I saw together back in the day. Uh, I do know for sure that we watched uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade together uh, at some now defunct movie theater in San Francisco. You may recall this one. I, yes, I don't did. know. Maybe yeah. I'm maybe I'm just taking a shot in the dark here. But I remember us having a great time at those films. And more than forty years after the release of the first Indiana Jones movie, which was 1981's Raiders of the Lost Ark, we have a fifth and presumably final now, installment. Before it, you go any further, I just watched, uh, we just watched all four films about a week ago. This is great. And I got to tell, uh, way, I tell you, in. well, the first one is one of the most perfect movies ever made. You know, I can remember calling back to New York when I first saw it in a preview uh, uh, and calling Shecky and saying, hey, th- this is the best film I've ever seen. You know, this is just a perfect movie. Uh, and um, uh, the second one was terrible. The third, right, we, we laughed about that yeah. because of, you know, how uh, much of a drop-off of quality it was. And then, of course, you came out with Crusade, and it was terrific. We also felt it was great. Crystal Skull, eh, it's okay, you know. It's all right. It's not great, this, but it's okay. This is a step up from Crystal Skull, and it's, uh, again, presumably the final installment of five in this adventure series, uh, Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny uh, catches up with the relic hunting archaeologist Henry Walton Indiana Jones Jr. We learn he's a junior in the third movie where his father was played by Sean Connery and uh, basically put our, our hero in his place. Indi- and of course, Indiana he- was the dog. Yes, uh, which was a great joke. And uh, so... Uh, his friends call him Indy, and, and anyway, in this film, he's on the eve of his retirement from academia. And as before, Dr. Jones, fedora-wearing, uh, whip-wielding Dr. Jones, is played by Harrison Ford, who, who uh, may now be a craggy 80-year-old, but is still the same charismatic superstar he's been since his earliest screen appearances and, and fortunately, Dial of Destiny, which, by the way, is directed by James Mangold, who did, uh, among other things, uh, the Logan movie, which was the swan song for the Wolverine character, or, or was intended to be that way. He's, uh, this is a satisfying wrap on this four-decade story of Indiana Jones. So briefly, I don't want to spoil anything other than to say that a prologue is set near the end of World War II, and it launches the movie in in really rousing fashion as a digitally and, get this, believably de-aged Ford, and Indy's friend and colleague Basil Shaw, played by Toby Jones, are battling with uh, Nazi scientist Jürgen Wohler, played by the great Mads Mikkelsen, for a mysterious artifact known as the Antikythera, and uh, it later becomes uh, clarified uh, as the Archimedes dial. And again, to say more about it would be uh, irresponsible. But there's always a MacGuffin in the Indiana Jones, uh, in the Indiana, uh, Indiana Jones movies that, that triggers the expeditions. You know, it was the Ark of the Covenant in the first film, uh, some kind of uh, mystical stones in the second movie. It was the Holy Grail. And, you know, you get the idea. So... This happens, the movie fades to black um, after an extended chase sequence on a train uh, behind enemy lines, awesome. 
And we catch up with uh, a dispirited indie in 1969. And uh, the previous film, you know, I, I hope you've seen it. And if you haven't, so be it. But he marries his longtime love, Marion Ravenwood. And it turns out they have a son. Here in 1969, he's alone and seemingly miserable in a shabby New York City walk-up apartment until his life is upended uh, by agents under the direction of Voller, who is now working for NASA, Werner von Braun style, and continuing to pursue the Antikythera. Uh, Voller's, uh, ha he, has, he has goons and they ransack the office um, uh, that Indy has been using at the college. And at this point, Shaw's daughter, Helena, played by Phoebe Waller-Bridge of Fleabag, enters the fray, but you just don't know if she's a friend or a foe to Indy, uh, who, by the way, is her godfather. So can Indy get up for one last quest that's going to take him on a journey from, from a Manhattan ticker tape parade for the Apollo 11 astronauts to a diving expedition in the Mediterranean? He's trying to preserve history. You know, even when things get preposterous, because the script is credited to four writers, and it is literally all over the map, uh, Mangold keeps things moving at a brisk clip, and Ford... Uh, in tandem with Waller Bridge, uh, they they closed the deal for me. I, I enjoyed this more than Crystal Skull. I don't want to say much more about the uh, the movie. We we know about the character and and people love him. And this is kind of a nice way to wrap things up in my book. Okay, so yeah, I give it I give it a uh, you know the the thumbs up. I I would say. You know, the actor's age here, by the way, brings real gravitas and uh, the occasional winds of pain uh, to this figure who manages to save the day more often than anyone could imagine. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, I do recommend it. it. It's not great. It's not up to the first and the third films. But what is, as you said, Raiders of the Lost Ark, a perfect movie in so many ways, written by Lawrence Cast and directed by Steven Spielberg. Just a lovely film. But this is a nice way to wrap things up for mm -hmm. him. So I, I do recommend you see it. Okay, Let next. Us, uh, Asteroid City. Um, this is a uh, an idiosyncratic, highly mannered movie from a filmmaker, Wes Anderson, who is idiosyncratic and highly mannered. Asteroid City is visually dazzling. It's a star-studded 1950s period piece set in a southwestern desert town that's playing host to a national student science fair. Uh, it's also known for having been the place where uh, a meteor crashed some time ago. Uh, there are atomic tests going on nearby. It's the 50s. It's the desert. Anyway, no one who organizes the event realizes that it's going to be turned upside down by unexpected visitors. And as you well know, uh, that area uh, of uh, America is also known for strange sightings. Shall I use the letters? I will, UFO. Anyway, there is not a simple straight line narrative here. It is Wes Anderson. So this is a movie within a stage play complete with a narrator uh, played by Brian Cranston as a sort of Rod Serling type. And he's providing meta commentary and cast members are doing double duty as actors in the play and the movie. So we're in a big city theater watching the playwright working on his script, which segues into the play itself, which then cuts to the desert location, then shifts back to the theater fire escape for a conversation between actors and so on. This kind of structural craziness is Anderson showing off his creativity. Uh, it's a little self-indulgent, but that's Wes Anderson. And as much as I love some of his movies, like the Grand Budapest Hotel, the fantastic Mr. Fox. I think Moonrise Kingdom may be his best film. Uh, and as much as I uh, am totally in awe of his precision and how inventive he is in terms of art direction and the use of color and his wit and the weirdo characters and whatever, you know, sometimes he's a little too much and maybe Asteroid City struck me that way. Um, the cast, by the way, is massive. So many big names that some of them are reduced to like cameos of cameos, a single scene or, or one line. Uh, I, I wanted to uh, love The French Dispatch, which was his previous film, but it was really kind of episodic and had a ton of people in it, too. And sometimes the scenes would work, these little like shaggy dog stories. Other times they wouldn't. And Asteroid City uh, is a different sort of pastiche. It has 
moments of crazy comedy. Um, uh, it, there are issues about the military industrial complex and government overreach. It, uh, there's even a ships that pass in the night romance. And uh, th- there's parodies of the rich and well to do. And there are like some magic moments. Uh, and you've got the big names um, Cranston, Jason Schwartzman, Scarlett Johansson, Tom Hanks, Jeffrey Wright, Tilda Swinton, Ed Norton, so many. I, I don't, I'm not going to list them because there are just too many of them, although Jeff Goldblum is in the cast, or is he? Anyway, Schwartzman as a widower with three precocious young daughters, and actually, Johansson as a movie star actually, with a daughter of Actually, Goldblum shows up once as the camera passes by him, and then he is the alien. Yeah, I'm just saying, uh, that totally plays into what I was suggesting. It's a it's a brief glimpse, and then you really, it's just nuts, you know. Uh, Schwartzman is a widower with three precocious daughters. Johansson is a movie star with a daughter, and they have this kind of lovely chemistry, and that's the nicest thing in my book about the movie. Uh, they have a brief romantic interlude. Um, Asteroid City never quite takes off for me or lands, but man, well, we, it we, went, we, we went with great anticipation. Okay, right, which also can spoil a film for you because you're overplaying it before you've even seen it. And then we went to see it, and we're terribly disappointed by it. Just right, ter- terribly. Disappointed. I mean, th- there's some good jokes in there here and there. Oh, they, there's I some love- great. I had some good laughs in it. There are a lot of good visual gags. Uh, uh, but um, the, the fact is, the picture never quite ever lands. It never, right? You know, when I when I look at a film like Hotel Budapest or Budapest Hotel or whatever, uh, I look at a picture that I really love, you know, and that is just a masterstroke of his genius. And then I look at this and I go, this is probably not as good as Bottle Rocket, you know. Right, right. That's fair, and and I have to say. Uh, it may be a bit of a step up uh, from the French Dispatch, uh, but it's just as une- uh, uneven, and it's just not it's, up it's to the... It's visually stunning. It's Beautiful. visually stunning, and, you know, it's kind of like I used to say, even a bad uh, Alfred Hitchcock was better than anybody else. Well, bad Wes <laughs> Anderson is still better than a lot of other stuff. Uh, that know? is fair, and you and I both surely enjoyed... The uh, references to uh, Chuck Jones's Roadrunner cartoons in terms of the color scheme of the desert and the rock formation. And I don't want to blow much more of it. But the issue was for all the beauty of it and the artifice, there's so little emotional impact other than the Johansson and Schwartzman thing. Anyway, um, I, I still think his fans should go see it because you're right. Uh, uh, the second rate. Wes Anderson is better than so many well, other yeah, I'd movies. Wait for, I'd wait for it to come to a, uh, a streaming service near you, which should be pretty soon. So, you know. Uh, uh, a massive disappointment um, for me because it been so highly touted was the Flash movie, which I thought would be better than it was. Um, you know, the Flash is one of the most venerable superhero characters in the history of comics. Of course, his only power is he can move really fast. He can run. And there have been other similar superheroes. Uh, but DC's Flash was the first uh, in his original incarnation in the 40s uh, as this guy named Jay Garrick. I don't want to go into all the you know origin details, but we've seen a Flash TV series. We've seen a new Flash TV series, and we've seen the character introduced as part of the recent Justice League films from um, Zack Snyder and uh, DC Warner Brothers, where he is mentored by uh, Ben Affleck's Batman. And this particular Flash, sort of an amalgam of, I don't know, Peter Parker, Spider-Man, and and maybe Kid Flash is not the character I remember from the comics or even some of the uh, cartoons or the previous TV versions. Uh, And he's played by a problematic actor named Ezra Miller, who we all have read about if we're paying any attention to contemporary journalism. This guy's an overgrown problem child. But he is charismatic, and he's a good actor, and he plays comedy well. And there are funny moments in this movie about this super speedster. The problem is it's based on a story from the comics called Flashpoint, which is about him trying to prevent his mother from dying. Uh, He's... Uh, always carried the burden of guilt of did, his did mom. Did they already he, do that on the TV version, though? 
Yeah, absolutely. I, and they just can't get away from it. The, the difference here is uh, it's the movie version of him trying to See, stop here, his mom what from I dying. Don't, here's what I don't understand. You had a very successful TV show. Right. Okay. With a very with an actor, uh, what's his name? Gustav. Red what? Gustin. Everybody Gustin. loves the guy. Red he's Gustin. he's yeah. really charming and wonderful. Why, he's very why, much. Why don't you just get him to be the Flash? He's very much. He's more like the the comic book Flash and the Flash as he was written than this guy who was like I said. They made him younger and goofier. It, it just didn't make any sense. But to make a long story, and it is a long story, really or uh, considerably shorter. Flashpoint is about. The guy going back in time, he runs so fast he can, like, run through time, and he wants to go back and save his mom uh, from dying, and his father has been accused of murder, and mm -hmm. by the time we meet the Flash in his early 20s, his dad's been incarcerated for years, and he wants to free his father. This movie lives, leaves a massive plot hole. This Flash never bothers to find out who actually does kill his mother. I mean, what? What, were they saving this for a, another movie that was never going to come out? So, uh, honestly, and there's by all the this way, By the way, can I add, this picture is doing terrible business. It is not doing well. Uh, the, one, um, the one thing they tried to do was, since going back in time and trying to change history will alter the universe around you or create a branching universe, they brought back the Batman uh, of Tim Burton's movies, played by Michael Keaton. And they introduce a Supergirl and uh, so on and so forth. And they have Michael Shannon's Kryptonian Zod invade Earth to destroy it or take it over without a Superman to save the world. And they have cameos of various other DC heroes. But honestly, I, I just felt like for all of the machinations of Christina Hodson's everything but the cosmic treadmill script and the talent of the director andy muschietti who did the um recent remakes of stephen king's it which i kind of liked this just doesn't it, it's just such a hodgepodge and and i'll tell you one thing it starts off really strong with a terrific sequence where a hospital nursery is destroyed by an explosion and the flash has to save this rain of babies and i really thought we got something going here. Unfortunately, uh, by the end, I was exhausted. Two hours and 24 minutes. I'm over this take on the Justice League. Uh, bring on the next DC Universe uh, ASAP. Um, it's well, in theaters I'll tell you still. the next DC Universe you've heard is going to play Lois Lane, haven't you? Yeah, I know. The, uh, the yeah. marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Come on. Come I know. on. You know, I mean, when you cast people you don't want to cast people that are so well associated with another character like mrs mazel that you then put her in as lois lane and expect people not to see mrs mazel you, know? you are correct and they had emma mackey from um a variety of different films that i've loved and a the tv show about the uh the, the the kids in the high school in England that are kind of randy and, and sexy and what have you, she's great, and people wouldn't have associated her with anything other than Lois you know, this Lane. Lois Lane performance. Yeah, yeah. It would have been smart. By the way, I find it intriguing, I'm glad you brought it up, that they uh, cast David, uh, uh, whatever his name is, Corn, uh, what's his name, Cornesweat or Cornsweaty? I can't even remember the guy's name. He's been mostly in Ryan Murphy movies. Uh, and you can uh, and TV programs. So take that for what it's worth. He doesn't strike me. He's kind of slim looking, and I, I just thought that's, I don't know about super, the case. That's Superman. Yeah, and you know I, I, I got to tell you, go make a movie. Go ahead. I don't care. I've been watching, uh, uh, you know, Superman and Lois, and that is such a good show now, you know, and it is so evocative of the whole genre that to make a, a, a Superman and Lois movie is, is is beyond comprehension. You've already got the best version of it. You know? Right, and, and it, it's the update where they're married and have kids, which has happened in the comic books. And I'm telling you right now, Tyler Hoechlin and Bitsy Tulloch are the best Clark and Lois since Christopher Reeve and Margot Kidder, yeah, flat yeah, out. Very good. Very good. Very, and you feel the warmth and the love and the caring and the, what, you know, 
It, yeah. it, it's a great, if people haven't watched the show, by the way, watch it. It's uh, still, it's been renewed for another season, thank goodness, but for only 10 episodes. But it's, this year has been incredible. She gets breast cancer and they deal with that. And they're, right. they're just a there's whole bunch, they're human uh, issues there, they deal with, you know. There's something that even Superman can't, can't really stop. And, right. and it's really a powerful uh, showcase for both Tullock and Hulkland. And I also want to say uh, Michael Cudlitz introduced at the end of the third season, finally, as Lex Luthor, who has been in prison because of an article that Lois uh, wrote years ago. And he is one of the most chilling. I mean, Gene Hackman in the original Superman movie, the Richard Donner, that guy was a clown. Well, they were, all, guy, they, were, they were all comic book versions. This is a very realistic Lex Luthor. Anyway, you better get on with the rest of this. Otherwise, yeah, yeah, yeah. we're going to be here till the rest of them. Elemental is the uh, latest Pixar animated feature, uh, and it's a disappointment in comparison to, to most of the studio's premier films. And it's been you know, losing, the, it's losing money like mad. It, it, uh, the Incredibles, Toy Story, Inside Out, the recent Oscar winner Soul, unimpeachably great. This, unfortunately, is about too many things. It's a kind of a, a naughty romance that's central to it. Essentially, the hook is our heroine and hero live in a world comprised of people who are either made of water, fire, earth, or air. So Ember's a girl of the fire people, and Wade is a boy okay, of the water right. people, and it's like okay. Montagues and Capulets. And I just was, I just thought despite the meat cute i thought it was clumsy uh, it's well-meaning heart in the right place stuff it must have seemed exciting when they were pulling it together and, and the idea of people being ghettoized because of their differences and it deals with immigration and other things but man it just does not work for me and honestly some good voice work and uh, also pixar's Beautiful, beautiful animation. The character designs that didn't work for me either. They're so uneven. Uh, and the characterization okay. of each sector of elemental society is, you know, it's not bad, but it's just one of the less cohesive Pixar movies. As Marjorie movies. would refer to it, it's a must miss and it will be on Disney Plus, I guarantee, within a month. Yeah, I believe you're right. Uh, so um, moving on from Elemental, let's uh, see if we can wrap things up quickly. I do want to say, if you are a superhero fan, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, the second in an animated series that introduced uh, a series of feature films that introduced Miles Morales, who is a Spider-Man in the comics, a young kid whose uh, personal history uh, repeats Peter Parker's in a way, and he's forced to pick up the slack when Peter's out of commission. Uh, it's wonderful. Uh, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse won the 2018 Academy Award for Best Animated Feature, and deservedly, and all of the beautiful visuals and the kineticism of that film are on display again in the sequel, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. Um, I just love these movies. Uh, they're inclusive, but not clumsily so, and visually stunning. And one of the disappointments about it, and maybe the only one, is it's uh, the second in a trilogy, and there is a cliffhanger. But I have to tell you, all the voice work, uh, all the visuals, the writing, uh, a universe of different spider people all converging uh, to uh, fight a big bad or deal with the changes in, uh, you know, in the, our dimension and, and theirs. Um, and you got cool voice work from everybody. I, this is the work of Phil Lord and Chris Miller, uh, who did uh, the Lego movies. They also are responsible for Clone, Clone High, which is a really uh, wonderful TV series, animated series that they've revived after 20 years. Um, you know, I think these movies are great. I, what did you think of the first one? Did you happen to see it? Uh, I, I, vaguely, I vaguely remember it, and I vaguely remember liking it, yeah. Yeah. Well, a third Spider-Verse movie's on the way to wrap up the trilogy. It can't get here too fast. But in the meantime, this is a brisk two hours and 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just, I wasn't bored for a second. Um, I really loved it. Of all the films we're discussing today, this is the yeah. one I like the best. Although I have such a warm place in my heart for Indiana Jones. Finally, I just want to say uh, the Fast and Furious movies and The Little Mermaid uh, both came out a few weeks ago. The Little Mermaid is one of those, why did you bother making 
making a live action version of a perfect movie. Not as perfect as Raiders of the Lost Ark. Although they did a pretty good job with Beauty and the Beast. I was amazed with that one. It actually, you're right. Yeah. That yes, that one worked. And I this, was, and, and that's one of my favorite Disney uh, animated features. And right. to make it as a live action, I was ready to sit there and just go, "This sucks," but it didn't. You know, uh, this uh, it, this doesn't work. Uh, I mean, uh, the props to everybody involved, but uh, the recent live action Pinocchio, based on the animated Disney, uh, Peter Pan and Wendy, uh, all these things from Disney, where they're trying to hold on to their IP or reassert it on these classic public domain stories. I, I, I just this these are cra- uh, cash grabs, and well, I like I like the fact that they made her black because, in fact, this was written uh, by Hans Christian Andersen, if I'm not mistaken, in a very white country. Right. <laughs> you know? well, so. I, I have to I have to say the girl, uh, the newcomer uh, who plays. Um, uh, the Little Mermaid, Halle Bailey, not to be confused with Halle Berry, is lovely and has a beautiful singing voice and a winning smile. And yeah, Javier Bardem plays, uh, her name is Ariel, of course. Uh, Javier Bardem plays the, the disapproving father, King Triton. Mm-hmm. You know, you got Melissa McCarthy as the villainous, bellowing uh, cephalopod uh, Ursula and Oakland's own David Diggs. Uh, we love the guy from Hamilton and Snowpiercer is the voice of Sebastian the Crab. But none of this. This is one creepy looking CGI crab. Aquafina voices a uh, clueless, good hearted seagull okay, and steals yeah, okay. every scene. But yeah. who cares? Yeah. Who cares? Yeah. I just don't feel like it. Why bother? And finally, I do want to mention Fast X. It ends on a cliffhanger. It's more Fast and Furious lunacy uh, featuring Vin Diesel as Pater Familius Dom Toretto. It's all about family. And uh, it's directed by Louis Leterrier, who made, among other cool films, The Transporter with Jason Statham. This mm-hmm. is just junk. And one of the coolest things about it is the fact that the villain here uh, is played by Jason Momoa in like as if he's the Joker in the Dark Knight trilogy, as if he's it's like so over the top that I was entertained but it, it's long and it's noisy and it just didn't give a damn and it ends on a cliffhanger. So fast X, you know, I, I give it an X. Yeah. Anyway, so that's, yeah. We uh, Did we get through all of them? Yeah, we did. I just wanted to, like, get a little wrap up on these blockbusters. I know. We uh, haven't done it in quite a while. And this is the longest uh, of, uh, episode of this series that we've ever done. Well, we'll take a few weeks yeah. off, maybe, or a week yeah. or so off, and come back with, uh, we'll yeah. talk about the new Mission Impossible, another movie that's going to end on a cliffhanger. Speaking of cliffhangers, uh, what are you watching, buddy? Uh, well, you know, there's, a, there's a, a show that I recommend to everybody that's on Amazon Prime, and it's called The English. Uh, ah, The Western with uh, yeah. Emily Blunt. Excellent yeah. show. Really great show. Uh, I won't say what it's about, and it has an ending that you don't even see coming, you know. Uh, it's six episodes, and it's just, I think it's pretty spectacular. We really enjoyed it. We thought it was terrific. Um, um, I will say quickly, I'm glad that Strange New Worlds, the Star Trek series, is back. Yeah, I've been I, enjoying I watching it. I the latest episode was very good. Very I, good. Uh, I agree, and I had caveats because they've gone and introduced Paul Wesley as James T. Kirk, yeah. which is almost an impossible thing for anyone to undertake uh, in the wake of Shatner's well, performance. But you're right; this was a hell of a, the last two episodes. Well, somebody would say uh, who could be better than Shatner, and I'd say just about anybody. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look, uh, I'm loving that. I'm loving Silo on Apple. Great Silo, science. Silo's yeah. a, just an absolute delight. I did not expect it to be that good. Rebecca Ferguson uh, is the star, and it's about a dystopian situation where people are living underground and uh, in, being in essentially kept from the a, in essentially a silo. Uh, yeah, uh, hundreds of stories deep into the ground, and finally, The Bear series two on FX. I can't get and into I guess, that. Can't get Hulu. into it. I'm I'm kind of a foodie, so I really enjoyed it. It's about this uh, troubled young man trying to uh, make a, a restaurant happen yeah. in his native Chicago let, with his family. Let me play, That's it. Let me play the theme. So yeah. we can get out of here under 30 minutes, okay? Do it. <laughs> tell, them where they, tell them where they can find you, Michael. 
I am on Twitter at Culture Blaster and on uh, Facebook at Michael Snyder's Culture Blast page with Alex Bennett and my pals. Uh, and uh, always happy to be here at GabNet, buddy. Thank you very much, Michael. And we'll see Michael again really soon, okay? Because we got a lot of movies coming out now. And you all stay tuned. There's more GabNet coming right up.